everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Laura Wills and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at Dickinson College. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I have you all muted right now, but we'll have the opportunity for questions at the end of Adam's presentation. So um, there's a little questions box that's up. And if you have any questions, please type them in and I will ask them um, of Adam at the end. So I wanna thank Adam Spiegel for joining us. He's from the class of 2006. He's a whiskey maker and 10 years ago founded the Sonoma Distilling Company in California. He will be leading us on a guided walkthrough of the whiskeys he makes. He'll share his knowledge of whiskey, answer any questions and introduce his four main products. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Adam. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm, I'm incredibly blessed that I've been able to um, sort of give a consistent level of communication to the Dickinson community um, for the better part of the last eight to 10 years since I started my business. Um, for many years, some of the people here might have actually gone through and, and done a tasting that I hosted at Dickinson. Um, when we can all get out of our basements, I'm hoping we can do that again. Um, but in the interim, you know, let's 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 enjoy a little bit of whiskey together. Um, sort of the format of this that I'd like to do um, is a couple fold. Uh, first and foremost, um, I I want to introduce you to the products that I make. Um, in, in so doing, um, talking a little bit about our approach to how we make whiskey at Sonoma Distilling Company, uh, which I, I co-founded in 2006, uh, 2010. Um, but I think more, more largely, I think it'd be nice just to talk about whiskey culture in general um, and whiskey history in general, because, you know, where we sit in, in the, the grand scheme of things is, is we're a tiny craft distillery north of San Francisco by about an hour. Um, but we believe that the, the history is guiding a lot of the decisions that we're making and it's helping us create really unique and different whiskeys um, that no one else is doing. And, and, we're, and we, I can say that because even in a crowded marketplace of 2000 distilleries, um, we are making bourbon in some many cases, but also rye whiskeys and single malts out of traditional pot stills um, in the heart of wine country. So there's a lot of really cool intricacies about what we're doing that I think is gonna make um, the, the, the flavor profiles that are tasted, but also our unique approach a little different. Um, so just to sort of begin, um, I started my business up in 2010. Um, my, my original sort of idea to start a distillery actually sort of began in 2008. Um, I'm sorry for people have heard the story before, but um, I lost my job with, with thousands of other people in the United States in 2008. Um, I, I was a fallout of the financial crisis. I was working in financial sales and the company that I work for let go of 600 people in a day. And I found myself in a really unique position where I didn't have a job. I also was a salesperson and didn't really feel like I had any tangible skills at that time. So I got to a place where I said, I need to go out there and, and reinvent myself. I need to go out there and do something different. And I need to learn a skill that will take me the rest of my life to master. So I started making beer, beer turned into wine, wine turned into grappa. And then that was sort of my gateway drug into getting into whiskey. And that was 2008 uh, in, a, in a little garage in Santa Rosa, which is north of where the distillery is. So if you're in San Francisco and you go over the Golden Gate Bridge, you're on the 101 a highway. If you keep on going north, you hit Roner Park, about 45 minutes off to the bridge. That's where the distillery is. If you go a little further north, that's where I started actually distilling, which is in the garage in Santa Rosa. And what was really unique about that opportunity was when you're doing things on such, such a nano scale, you can make a lot of mistakes. And in the early years, we, we burnt a lot of batches and we made a lot of mistakes. But we really felt like every time we did, we were getting incrementally better at what we did. And so by about 2008, 2009, myself and an old business partner realized that the stuff we were making was better than what we were buying on the commercial markets. Even if it was young, it was still relatively flavorful and good and different. And so we, we looked into how to start a distillery. And at that time, there was nobody out there. So we were the 15th distillery in California. 
now there's roughly almost 120, 130. And in the United States, we're within the first 200 distilleries and now there's close to 2000. So a lot of people jumped into this space really quickly, um, which is exciting because it allowed a, sort of this beautiful sort of foliage to, to, to grow around us, uh, given, given me the opportunity to sort of put my head in the sand and just make whiskey. Um, but it also presented a, a lot of challenges because now it's a very crowded marketplace. Now, this whole COVID thing has added a completely unique element. And uh, no matter what I, I say here today, I would strongly encourage everybody listening to, to, to support their local brands. I mean, certainly support Sonoma Distilling Company, but I, I also ask that you think about the 2,000 other distilleries all over the United States, some that are in your hometowns or some that are within a rock throw where you live. Um, they're all trying. They're all making unique things. And a lot of them are going into hand sanitizer, which we're, unfortunately we're not going into because of the type of stills that we use. I'm not sure if Laura, you want to try and pull up that picture of me with that still. We'll probably reference it a couple times, but I see your desktop here with all the pretty icons. I'm not sure if that's the only thing I, I'm not sure if I'm the only one seeing that or not, but, um, but then we've got, uh, so distilling locally craft, we, we all appreciate it. And we're, I've got a, a team of 10 that would greatly appreciate any and all business there. Um, but when I first started up 2010, not a lot of people out there. And so one of the first things we made out of the gate was a rye whiskey, which at that time, if you think about what was going on in 2010, you got Boardwalk Empire out, you've got sort of this, this craft cocktail movement really getting big. And so what we found was is a lot of people were really craving rye and we wanted to make a rye that was different. We wanted to make a rye that really tasted like rye or rye bread. And so trying to play around with different ingredients was difficult because rye is a very a really tough grain to cook. Anybody who might be a home brewer on here, you'll appreciate what I'm talking about. Rye is a very sticky grain, has a tendency to, to, to burn really easily. So when I go back to that whole sort of R&D project from 2008 to 2010, that was really sort of where it all began. And then from 2010, we founded our business originally called 1512 Spirits. And then by about 2013, you know, three more years into doing this, this task, um, running pretty much all the elements of the business. So we were, I was helping, I was distributing it. I was making it three, four days a week um, and balancing the checkbook and trying to figure out everything else that was going on. Myself, my old business partner split. We decided we were going to go in two different directions. We wanted to pursue two different lives. And so I got into um, the business by myself uh, in 2013. I re refrained, refrained, refounded the company, changed the name, became the Sonoma Distilling Company. Um, and since then we've been growing, which is really exciting. So my first distillery was about 784 square feet. Um, and then I grew from 784 square feet. Today we're at 21,000. Um, I've got a staff of 10 people working for us, um, even through COVID at the moment. And it's, it's been really a, a labor of love, super exciting. Um, certainly challenging at times too, um, but something that we take a lot of pride in today. So let's get into whiskey. Let's get into the whiskeys that we make. Um, what I, when I do a tour at the distillery, which at some point, if anybody here wants to come and actually do a tour when the, when the gates reopen and we can all run free, um, we'd love to have you. And I will happily comp a tasting to any Dickinson person, just reach out to us you can easily come in for a, a comp tasting on, on me, no problem. Um, but the reality is when you come to our facility, we're going to look a lot like a brewery. And most people wonder why that is. And then the truth is, is that all whiskey starts as beer. So if you think about the history of, of what distilled spirits really is, it's a preservation of something that would, would have a shelf life to it. So think about beer, beer can go bad if not properly preserved or, or that or not made very well. Um, wine can go bad. Um, we use what's called the Alembic still. So we use a very archaic style still that has a really brown bulbous body, a mosaic top, a lin arm, there's an arm that connects between the top of the head of the still and the condenser. And the condenser is where you chill that vapor and turn it back into liquid again. And I'll, I'll talk more about that too. But we use a very archaic still on purpose. And think about the fact that this is old Moorish technology. So the top of our still looks like a mosque for a reason. It's actually supposed to be sort of the hands of God 
cleaning up water and giving that, that water back to the people. So really exciting sort of history note there. You know, this is old, you know, 1100s technology the Europeans took and then the, 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 the different monasteries made their chartreuses and cabodoses and cognacs and then eventually scotches. And so and rakias and all sorts of stuff too. So we, we make a beer, which is our distiller's beer to start. So all whiskey starts as beer. Anybody who tells you otherwise is selling, selling you a bag of seeds. Um, all whiskey starts as beer. Generally speaking, we make our beer differently than breweries do. So we take grain. Now we're sourcing 100% of our grains now from California, which is super exciting because for a long time we were buying grains from all over the United States. Um, we've been able to work with growers for the last 10 years and finally convinced them that we, we, we have enough of a market, discernible market to, to work with them on. Um, we, are, we are sourcing our grains from the state of California now 100%. We also have a malt house on site, which I'll talk about as well. Um, all of that ingredients are done on site. We take we take a, what's called a hammer mill. We typically bring those raw ingredients in. So imagine rye or corn or wheat that's grown out in the field. It gets cleaned, so it removes all the husks and all the other bad stuff. It gets brought into our facility. We run it through a hammer mill, smash those grains, turn them into a flour. That flour is then put into a grist case, which is then transferred into a mash tun. Heated up water is added to hydrate the grains. And inside of that, that vessel, you've got a big, huge, hot pile of grain. So imagine you're making polenta or you imagine you're making oatmeal at home. After those grains have been heated up with hot water and the water has been added to that, 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 that mash as well, you then begin to start adding a malted ingredient. So that malted ingredient takes all of the available starches. So starch turns into sugar by adding a malted ingredient. So it's the same thing as I'm sure everybody's ever seen the the dogfish head guys, but they're going out there and putting grains in their mouths and chewing and spit into a bucket. That's, that's an old way of using enzymic conversions that happen in your mouth to actually go into uh, to, 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 to convert starch into sugar. We do that, of course, without saliva. We do that, of course, with, with malted ingredients. Now, there are plenty of people who use synthetic enzymes. There's absolutely no qualm or problem with that whatsoever. It's a, certainly another approach that other folks have taken. Um, but we take a very traditional approach because that's the way I was taught and that's the way that we always have to do it. So grain, water, we then be begin to cool down this big old bath that's full of sugar down to about 80 degrees where our yeast loves to propagate. You pump it into a fermenter. Inside that fermenter, you apply yeast. So grain, water, yeast, you got three ingredients so far. Then you begin to, chance to, to transfer all of the, the sugar turns into alcohol. So I always tell people it's, it's the yeast is eating all of the sugar. It's, it's, it's farting out carbon dioxide and it's pooping out alcohol. Uh, very simplistic way to look at it. After about five to six days, that entire vessel has no more sugar in it and the yeast dies off. So we use what's called a sweet mash. So you oftentimes might see on a bottle where it says the word sour mash. So what a sour mash means is that a, a distillery will take previous yeast to, to basically restart the program of fermentation. Now what that does is it ties in the flavor profile of the previous mash to the new mash. And the only reason I don't like doing that is first of all, it's a very Kentucky style and I'm making whiskey in the state of California. Um, but also because of the fact that I like my whiskeys to be a bit drier. So anytime you'll ever go out there and try any of my products, you'll notice that our whiskeys have a bit of a drier flavor profile to them. That's because I'm using a sweet mash, which is a brand new yeast, fresh yeast comes out of a bag. I rehydrate the yeast back up and it does a really effective job of converting sugar into alcohol. After about five to six days, there's nothing left in there. So we do a sweet mash, fermentation out. We leave the tops of our fermenters open. So this goes back to what I mentioned before about sort of the Provence or some people say terroir and whiskey. That's a big debate that I'll arm wrestle somebody about later. Um, but the reality is there, is there is a Provence about whiskey. Where a whiskey is made can develop signature flavors from that place. So anybody who knows the Bay Area knows we've got a lot of fog. So we get a beautiful fog that comes in. We're 15 miles away from the coast. We get a nice sort of fog layer that settles into the Sonoma Valley. That's, what, that's where we bring a lot of that salty, briny air from the, from the ocean. 
that penetrates our whiskey because our tops of our fermenters are wide open. So not only does it get that salinity and saltiness that comes in our whiskey, but it's also where we get a lot of lactobacillus and Brettanomyces and all our fun little bacteria friends that actually affect our flavors as well. And so tops open, again, another differential, differential from the breweries who leave their lids closed because they typically like controlled, slow fermentations. We like active, big, super volatile uh, fermentations because we don't want it to ferment too long. We also don't, because we don't want to let it live in that open top fermentation too long. So we got to pull it out and run it through a still. Now, we're running through distillation here. I think it's important to talk about a couple of things. There's a sort of the pre-industrial age approach to distillation and sort of the post-industrial age approach to distillation. So I subscribe to sort of the pre-industrial age. So I, I, if you think of scotches or cognacs or calvados, we all use traditional pot stills. Now those pot stills can vary from one gallon all the way up to 50,000 gallons. I think the largest still I heard about was Bushmills, which is like 131,000 gallons or something, which is crazy to think about. Um, but we we use five pot stills and, and you um, we we like the, the, the signature flavor, the viscosity, the mouthfeel. Again, think about a very traditional style approach. We like that. The post-industrial approach is, is more of a, a column still or a continuous still. And if you've ever been to a distillery before, you'll see a huge tower in there, little pretty windows. That's called a column still. And what's happening is, is the vapors are going inside the still and are, are rising through the head of the still and as they're going through each of these plates, they're, they're purifying themselves. They're refluxing back down and dropping back down again. Um, what's really exciting about that is, of course, you can make something that has some really nice sort of high notes and a bit more ethanol-driven spirit um, to produce, produce more grain-based spirits. A lot of bourbon guys are using traditional, are using um, column stills or continuous stills. And so it's a, it's a really effective way of removing alcohol from water, which is really all distillation. So let's get into distillation. Distillation is essentially applying heat in a closed vessel to remove alcohol from water. After about, you know, uh, basically between 175 degrees and 192 degrees, you're boiling water, uh, boiling alcohol. So distillation at its core is meant to be super simplistic. And as anybody who knows me from Dickinson, I was not the most studious human being. Um, but distillation in general is meant to be simplistic because again, all you're doing is closing a vessel up, putting a, 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 an alcoholic uh, mixture in there. So our beer generally is about 9% by the time it's done, nine to 10%, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. You put it into a, a vessel. I'll talk about pot stills in a second. I'll, I'll continue on my column still analogy here too. So after about um, 170 to 175 degrees in that closed vessel, as you've been applying heat, now no matter what your heat vessel is, if it's, if it's steam, if it's oil, if it's um, direct fire, like I did for the first 10, nine years of my life, um, the heating element is just heating up the still to, to begin the process of getting as close to a boil as possible. The alcoholic vapor boils off first because it boils between 175 degrees and 192 degrees. So all the vapor that is rising through that still begins to start to uh, evaporate or boil at a much lower temperature than water does. By the time you get to water, you're done. You turn that, that machine off, you flush everything out, you're good to go. Um, so distillation at its core, again, super simplistic, and a column still is rising through the various plates of the column and refluxing and purifying itself up until it's pure enough to go through, and either gets run again or gets redistilled again. Um, that's generally speaking how the, the post-industrial approach works. Ours, again, a bit more simplistic. Inside the body of the still, you, you add your 9, 10, 11% alcohol beer, you begin to apply heat, it rises into the head of the still because it's closed, refluxes back down and drops back down. Um, so if anybody saw the picture of the, the pot still that was behind me on the invite for this event or on the social media pages, that's my 3000 gallon Scottish still that I'm running today. I was, it was made for us by the Foresight Company out in Speyside, Scotland. Um, but that still, that head is receiving the, the, the vapor inside 
because it's colder outside, it's refluxing and dropping back down. So it's purifying itself until it's clean enough to go all the way through the neck and then gets chilled again by the, by the condenser, which has got cold water running through it and starts spitting out as alcohol, as, as alcoholic liquid. Um, American whiskeys are all double distilled. Scotches are double distilled, meaning they're running through the still twice. Irish whiskeys triple distilled. Um, so the differentiator there is in my system, it's a batch system. So I have to do everything in small batches. I have to rerun it again versus the capacity of a column still where I can instantaneously distill it over and over again because every time it runs through a plate, generally speaking, it's distilling itself. So anytime someone sees a vodka that's 20 times distilled, it very well probably went through 20 plates. Um, we run our process twice. The first time comes out as what's called low wine. So 9% has now become 30, 35%. You're just reconcentrating alcohol back down again. You then run it through a second time, which reconstitutes the alcohol a second time, raising the alcohol ABV from about 30, 35% up to 65 to 75%. You then apply, you, add, you drop it down using water. We use either reverse osmosis or spring water to reduce the water down, and then you put it into a barrel. So we've covered distillation, we've covered fermentation, um, I, I will certainly welcome questions at the end of that to, to, to talk more about what's, what's going on there. Um, once you've distilled the product twice, you've got this thing that's about 65 to 75% alcohol. You then apply the water to proof it down to barrel strength. American whiskeys go to barrel at, at below 125 proof. Once you go to, to barrel, you generally speaking are putting them in any size cooperage you want. The, the standard bearer is 53 gallons. That was the, what the Kentucky guys have always done. Um, I have plenty of 53s up. I've also used some 30 gallon barrels as well. I've also used some larger cooperage. Actually, I actually charged some barrels in Calistoga, which was a little crazy of a time, um, but we I built some 80 gallon barrels and, and did that work myself too. So. Um, but that afforded us the opportunity to put them away for a much longer period of time. So the bigger the barrel, the longer it can stay in there. Um, the, the barrels themselves are charred. So the barrels inside are completely burned out. The goal is to not um, allow for the, the soft tannins inside of the wood to go without a little bit of that, that burn, uh, the malactic burn inside of it. So inside those barrels, They've been burned, they've been charred, they literally put, put over a little campfire. And inside that, 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 that process, it, it releases all the wood sugars inside the barrel. You apply a, an alcohol in there and it begins to start soaking up the color instantly. So this is not alcohol, this is water, but believe me that all spirit comes out of it still completely clear. All that color it gets is from the barrel itself. Um, we've messed around with the variable degrees of char. Um, char is the different level of how long it sits on that, that campfire and before they pull it off as a determiner on there. They generally say it's like 45 seconds for a third degree char and a minute 20 for fourth degree char. So we're really talking about a, a blink of an eye is the difference between one level to the other, which is really part of the artisanness of all of it too. Wood sourcing is super important, just like grain sourcing is super important as well. Um, I'll certainly get into the, the my, my, my company also employs a lot of really green, um, you know, we have a green thumb here. Um, so I, I will definitely talk about that too, but um, we're going to jump into the products and start talking about the actual whiskeys themselves, because these are all age generally between two and a half and four year old whiskeys that we, we release into the general public. Uh, for those that actually have our product today, I, I would say thank you very, 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 very much. Um, we're only available today in about seven states. So that's California, Illinois, uh, New York, Florida, Minnesota, Missouri. Um, I think I got everybody in there. Um, in California, of course. Um, the retailers I listed before, most of those ship all over the country. So if any of these sound appetizing to you, please feel free to go on there and do that. Again, also feel free to trial your own local places too. I think they're all trying really hard. Um, 
I'm going to start off on bourbon because though it was the second thing I made at the distillery, um, I like to I like to start off on this really sort of unique um, California style bourbon. I I say that because most people think of bourbon having to be from Kentucky, and you're not wrong if you also think so as well. Uh, bourbon, generally speaking, um, for a long time was only made in Kentucky until 1967 when the, the federal laws changed and allowed bourbon to start being made anywhere in the United States became the United States whiskey of sorts, generally speaking. Um, this is my Sonoma bourbon. So this is a weeded bourbon. So what makes it a weeded bourbon is when you go back to the mash, the combination of grains that we used was corn. So 70% grown in California corn, 25% wheat grown in California wheat, and then 5% malted barley. So because of the wheat concentration, this thing being a little bit over 20%, um, anywhere between 20 and 35% is really the sort of sweet spot when you start talking about weeders or weeded bourbon. Now, other weeded bourbons most people think of are Maker's Mark, um, Pappy, um, Weller Antique, Old Fitzgerald, Larceny. So these are sort of traditional big, big guy whiskeys. And um, this is fun for me. I'm going to actually go through the flavor profile um, that we that we that we make. Um, I'm not sure what you all are drinking out of today, um, but I have some suggestions. So first and foremost, drink out of glass. Let's start at the basics now. That can be this, if you so choose, depends on sort of the day you're working with. But I, I ask you, I implore you to drink out of glass, uh, which is a change from plastic that I did at Dickinson. So high five there. Um, glass is important because glass can be cleaned. And usually speaking, glass has no bacteria inside of it. So ideally, you're not going to be using it out of your normal milk glass but most of the time if it runs through the sterilization process in your washing, in your dishwasher, you should be fine. Um, I tell people this all the time. The very first thing all of you should ever do if you're ever gonna try a whiskey of any sort, not even mine or anybody's, is smell the glass. Now, the reason that's super, super important is that you have the, the number one way to determine if something is good is right here. Um, and so I always tell folks that smell the glass, the number one most important thing you can do Choosing the right glass can be great. I've chosen two styles to show you. This is called a Glen Cairn glass, which my friends out in Scotland make. Um, there's also variations of that. This one has a stem on it. A wine glass would do fine. A shot glass would do fine, as long as it's been cleaned and as long as you give it a nice smell beforehand. If you smell something off in there, my suggestion is rinse it with water, throw it out, drink it um, until it gets to a place where it smells like nothing. The absence of smell is actually a good thing. Um, bourbon. So I'm going to talk about our Sonoma bourbon, the flavor profiles here. I talk about food pairings here quite a bit. Our Sonoma bourbon product, 70% corn, 25% wheat, 5% malted barley. This is a really traditional style bourbon. So this is the style bourbon that my grandmother, your grandmother should be drinking. Uh, or did drink back in the day, and so this is this is a, a burlap sacky, brown paper bag, leather you know new leather you know type of product. Um, our Sonoma bourbon, as I mentioned, is a little different not only because it's made in California. No, we don't currently use wine barrels today, though in time we probably will use um, some sort of finishing wine barrels. We can talk more about that too. But our Sonoma bourbon is a really traditional style approach to bourbons. One of the things that I learned early on in evaluating whiskey, and one of the things that I, I constantly am striving to do better at, and again, I always tell people I'm not a master distiller today, I, I'm a head distiller. I've only been distilling professionally for 10 years and unprofessionally for 12. But realistically speaking, you know, the things that I care about um, are, are evolving my palate. So I talk about food pairings a lot because that's one way that I can try and connect with all of you about what to do with these whiskeys when you bring them home. So 
cocktail wise, Manhattans or Sazeracs or Vucarets or very traditional style bourbon applicated um, cocktails. Super good idea. The other option you've got um, is like food pairings. So because this has that very new leather flavor profile to it, you know, think of like a canvas book, you know, a leather bound book. Um, I recommend, you know, like a, like a roasted chicken, duck fat fries, you know, that sort of uh, orientation. If you're not into eating meats, um, I always recommend like asparagus with um, a little bit of cheese on top if possible because of the hardiness of this, this product. And so I invite you as you try these things, not to be so myopic about how whiskey should or, or have historically been done because food and whiskey pairings is something that should and, and has existed. And just like with wine pairings or beer pairings, there are ways to move this product into applications, not just sort of like at the beginning of a meal or an after meal. And so our cinema bourbon product in particular, I'm strongly recommending people try with chickens and even a Thanksgiving turkey would be just fine. So that's our Sonoma bourbon, again, aged between two and a half and four years old, on site using local ingredients. Um, the water source we use to proof all of our spirits down, which is super exciting, is Cobb Mountain Spring Water, which is actually the second purest source of water in California. So on top of smelling a glass being super important, ideally, if you're ever gonna apply water, and this is my, my pretentious way of doing this, so this is the way they do it in Scotland. But if you're ever going to add water, I always recommend you use good water. So purified water is, is the, the basis of that, just to ensure no off flavors. But a local spring water, if you have access to it, is, is, is a great source of that. Because that's bringing some of your local flavor, just like I brought my local spring source into the flavor of the whiskey, which is great because no matter where it's sold, either in these seven states I discussed, or also over sales, overseas as well and have been for the last almost seven eight years I mean, it allows us to talk about local water local ingredients um, most of the products we we make are non-gmo and organic ingredients which is also exciting um, it's a good place to talk about the fact we have little wind turbines in the back of our bottles too so if you ever zoom on it you can see our little wind turbines there um, so we're 100 percent wind power too so i've been seeing the dickinson's been making some great uh, strides in this area too bravo to you uh, there is no planet b so as far as i'm concerned we all got to do our part um and so that's my way of hoping that in 20 or 25 years when i got my 20 or 25 year old whiskey coming out um that we're still going to have a planet um so soma bourbon cheers that's what i've got on this product i'm going to keep on moving down the lineup just to continue to introduce them um this is a good place are there any questions there that, that we should we should look at real quick no, I just have a uh, thank you from Adam, from David Cox, class of 05, saying thank you for presenting this webinar. Cool, I'll take that. If you happen to have any questions about either any of the things I'm trying or any of the things that I, I make, I, I strongly encourage you all to, to do that because there's, there's, no, there's no dumb questions. Um, so um, moving on to my, ne my next product. So Sonoma Rye. So from bourbon, which is really this super palatable, approachable, you know, the, probably our hottest seller. You know, admittedly, people like the word bourbon, and it's really easy for people to know what it is. A lot of times people are used to the Kentucky style. And again, I fully support the Kentucky style bourbon. They, it's not like I'm competing against Budweiser. I'm, I'm literally competing against like some of the most prolific bourbon houses in the world. And the fact that I can even make whiskey and a lot of times they have had a chance to actually try my stuff it makes me pretty pretty happy so cheers to that um gonna go into rye Please. whiskey so again sorry adam i i do have a bunch of questions here i'm sorry um oh, yeah. any thoughts on chill filtration versus non-chill pipe filtration is it hype just looks or is there a difference in taste so really really good question so uh, we don't chill filter at all, and that, that's part of our, our brand ethos a little bit. So what chill filtering is, is you take a, a big old batch of whiskey and you, you chill it. You, you literally either put it into a tank and drop that tank temperature down to stand there freezing, um, or you run it through a chill filter as you're going actually into the bottling line. And what that does is it, it, it freezes the, the spirit or chills the spirit to such a level 
that all the proteins drop. And the reason a lot of folks do that is because if you're producing 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 gallons of batch, you have no room for quality you know, re re recalls, issues in QC, your quality control. And so what ends up happening is the decision point is made to chill filter and make sure that all your solids are removed. So not just those proteins that drop, but any sort of dead fruit flies or fingernails, I'm just getting weird, but generally speaking, you need to be very careful about what might go into that bottle because QC issues can't happen at such a scale. And so that's a decision point that they make at that level. Now, most craft guys, I can't say everybody, but most craft guys have moved away from that because again, we're much smaller, so we can control the QC stuff on our own. We use filters, so don't be disguised. We actually are still filtering our product, but it's a very, very light filter. It's just a, a bug catch of the you know, 500 micron situation. Um, but the goal, of course, in, in, in not removing those proteins is that it gives you more mouthfeel, it gives you more flavor. And so, you know, for those who do it, I have no qualms that it's part of their decision making, it's part of their, their brand. Um, and honestly, to some folks, it's, it's, it's unnoticeable. But to the 10% or 20% that might notice it, I think it's worth leaving in. And so we've always made a, 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 an honest decision just to, to non chill to filter our products. Thank you for that. Good Before question. Another tasting. Could you expound upon your tasting techniques? How long do you hold it in your palate? Um, how, you know, different, do you take different types of sips? Do you move it around your mouth? Good question. Um, so you probably noticed a couple of things while I've been tasting. Um, and I, I invite you to actually try this at home. Um, I invite you to try tasting it with your nose plugged. And I re recommend you try tasting it with your nose unplugged. Um, you'll notice that a lot of the flavor that you get is from your smell. So the connection point between smell and the palate is incredibly, incredibly important. And so that's why a lot of times people will leave their, their, their noses certainly unplugged, but as I'm smelling something, I'll also leave my mouth slightly open. So you notice that there's always a little bit of a gap here. If you, if you smell something with your mouth closed, try it. I mean, try the difference between smelling something mouth closed, smelling something mouth open, you'll notice that there's just a slight different flavor profile there too. So when, before even something goes into your mouth, how you evaluate that spirit, not just how you smell the glass, the water choices you've used, ice choices you've used, you decide to put ice in it, but then just making sure that when you go to smell something, you do that. Now, this glass is great. And the reason why people like stems is another FYI, is that it keeps your fingers pretty far away from your, 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 your nose. And the reason that can be important is, especially if you're running a still, you know, the distillation process doesn't always smell great. There's, there's, a, there's, you're removing, there's a lot of fatty acids in there. Um, and so your hand sometimes will smell like distillation. You don't want it to smell like that while you're evaluating barrels. So stem glassware can be really helpful from that perspective. And that's why a lot of times people use stuff that's got this. That's why a wine glass, especially a white wine glass might be more ideal sometimes for you all, if you don't happen to have it, the Glen Karen, as long as you keep your fingers away from your nose, you're doing right. Now, when it comes to actually trying the spirit, my strongest recommendation there is put it in your mouth and, and try something twice. Um, now, smelling the spirit is different than smelling wine. So most people who smell wine, they sort of stick their noses directly in there. Now, the problem with doing that with, with ethyl alcohol is it's gonna burn the hell out of your nose. So don't do that. Um, but once you've had an opportunity to evaluate the spirit, when you've had a chance to, to put your nose on it, I recommend going high. So notice how my nose is high on the palate, on the, on the top of the glass here. Um, that allows the, the vapors to come to your nose, which is why these, these sort of tulip shaped glasses are also super important too, because imagine it's shooting the flavor profile where it wants to go versus a wide lip glass, which is dispensing the flavors out. So. Um, I keep on talking about smell, but the nosing of, of whiskey is incredibly important to, to its process. Um, from here, put it into your palate. I recommend you try it twice. I recommend it's sort of a scorched earth thing on the first one. So as much of that liquid in a small amount that you can have it coat your tongue is incredibly important. And the reason is 
you're going to neutralize your palate. So you're going to knock out all of these off flavors um, that you might have been drinking coffee all day long. I've had a goyaki a little while ago too. So what's going to do is you're going to, it's going to literally get to a place where it's going to, it's going to knock out everything else you've got on there. You've neutralized your palate. And then when you have a chance, you can go through it and start evaluating the spirit because you've neutralized your palate and you retry it again. So you don't have to use the scorched earth maybe on the second one. I always like to think that you would really want that spirit to sort of hit the middle of your tongue and let it sort of bounce off the middle of your tongue. Um, but you got to try things twice because you got to neutralize it. It's, you got to, you got to freshly bake each one and that's the only way to do it. Thank you. Is there a whiskey equivalent to swirling the glass and looking for its legs? And how can you discern whether whiskey is good? Sorry if I missed the last one. How did I discern if whiskey is what? Good. Good. Uh, so, uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, imagine that a whiskey um, has been in its bottle since it was bottled, obviously, duh. Most whiskeys come with some sort of a seal on top. So it's doing a really good job of locking in all those flavors in there. So the very first thing I'll ever do, if I ever get a bottle of whiskey, just like I do with a bottle of wine, let it breathe. That's totally fine. You're not losing your investment out of the top of your bottle. It's opening up. It's breathing a little bit. It's not going anywhere. I've seen plenty of people who've left bottles of whiskey available open all night. You come back the next morning, it's definitely lost some of its alcohol, but it's not gone. So open top, totally fine, lets it breathe. The swirling you might see me or anybody else ever do is potentially out of boredom. You know, there might be a little bit of, of that in there too. But some of it is also just to see, you know, sort of the legs on there too. So there's legs in whiskey, just like there is in wine, because um, there's sugar. So you see those legs coming down the side of my glass, I'm not sure how easy it is to see them there. Um, but that's, those are wood sugars and those are, those are flavors that are coming, those are fat, fat coming down the side of it. Um, so you, you want to make sure it's present there. So the way you do that is you just swirl around your glass and see if it's in there. So I strongly recommend people try that at home. There's no, there's no qualms about it. Again, these are your whiskeys. You can do whatever the hell you want with it. I had some people who get embarrassed to tell me that they mix our whiskeys. They mix them with cocktails, or they mix them with Coca-Cola. And I tell them all the time, you bought the bottle, it's yours, you do whatever the hell you want with it. So at the end of the day, uh, my strong suggestion is if you're gonna do it, do a nice little swirl on it. Let the, 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 the concentration of air to distillate in here is, is, is far less. So you're gonna be aerating the hell out of this. Just like a lot of times people ask me, hey, like, does a bottle of whiskey go bad? No, unlike wine, you can open a bottle of whiskey today close it, drink, open it back up again in a week, a month, a year from now, and it's still going to taste good. As long as you're not drinking below the halfway mark on a bottle, so once you get basically to a place where the air has a larger concentration than the liquid, at that time, if you're really trying to preserve that bottle, I always decant them into smaller bottles. So especially people who are whiskey collectors, who are really, you know, plenty of people who are hoarding their Pappy Van Winkles, um they'll drink half the bottle take it decant it into a smaller bottle and just make sure that they've locked it in because then you just reduce down the, the surface ratio of the air and you're good to go um so whiskey doesn't necessarily get worse with more time it actually can get better because once you've opened the bottle up you've now reintroduced new air into the bottle now that i've closed it that air and that water is that air and that distillate are, are opening it up and sort of letting it breathe a little bit. So um, I've had some whiskeys from like the 1960s that have been sitting there in a non-open bottle or in a bottle that was left more than halfway, um, less than halfway drank, and they taste freaking great. So that's that's also pretty exciting stuff. Oh, and how do you know if whiskey's good? Um, that's entirely up to the drinker, and I and I respect that the, the the process of evaluating whiskey for you. Um, it really depends on the application, depends on your price point. Um, it just, I mean, that that's applicable almost with anything else in your life. But um, you know, the reality is, once you find a spirit that you like, ideally trying to find other ones in that category is really a fun thing. There's a fun connection point there. So if you're a rye drinker, you might want to try other ryes. You might also want to try high rye bourbons. 
Um, so being able to identify who those are takes a little bit of research. Um, scotch drinkers in particular, there's a lot of geographic locations that make a certain style of scotches. So that can become really fun for you. You can look at various places like Highlands or Speyside or Isla or what have you. That gets really, really, really exciting. Um, and then sometimes with barrel finishes, it becomes even more exciting too. So if you're really, really into rum or really, really into cognac, um, a lot of whiskey guys are doing cognac finishes or rum finished barrels, and that's going to bring all, sort of the two worlds together. And that's really a, a fun thing for you to do. So I think the whiskey is in the eye of the beholder. Truly it is. Um, what makes a good whiskey from my perspective is balance. Um, so something that really has a, a, a nice discernible balance to it, something that doesn't taste like it's overtly um, hot or too too sharp. Um, something that you can pour out of a glass into a pour out of a bottle into a glass and drink it without the need for ice or water is usually a good one. Even at cast strength, even at a barrel, even out of a barrel strength uh, bottling, which we do as well in our single barrel program. Um, we just relaunched our, our whiskey club where I'll be able to release stuff like that that people who are in a whiskey club can try. Just check out our website. You can see that. But the opportunity to be able to drink something the way that the blender intended it, either at cat strength or at barrel strength or at the bottle strength at whatever level they chose, they chose that level for a reason. And so um, you just kind of use that as your indicator, try it, and make your own decision about what you think of it. Uh, I'm going to jump into rye whiskey real quick. I know we're, we're getting close to the top of the hour here. So um, my Sonoma rye is 100% rye. So it's 80% unmalted, 20% rye malt. Now the 80% unmalted, California grown, 20% rye malt has historically come from the UK. Now, excitedly, we have begun testing the local rye. Uh, we have a local rye um, that we've been either malted on site or malted in a nearby facility. Um, there's three malt, or, malt houses in California and two of them within, one on site and one within about an hour of us. Um, what a malt house is, just to talk about it really quickly, is you take raw ingredients, you germinate those grains, you, you basically trick them into becoming a plant. You then lock in that enzymic conversion by kilning them or, 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 or heating them up. Um, once that process is done, you can then take that enzymic conversion it would have taken from becoming a plant into becoming, um, to converting starch into sugar. So all that's basically a power source for that little seedling to become a plant. So we, we fool it, we trick it, we then use that enzyme conversion to convert all the starch and the sugar inside that mash like I talked about before. We do that now on site too. When you come visit us, you can see that. But adding 20% rye malt out of the UK makes this 100% rye, but it makes it something that has a sort of a layers of flavor to it. So one of the things I take a lot of pride in is that this whiskey's got a really, really beautiful bouquet nose to it. It's spicy, but it's got a, a lot of viscosity and mouthfeel because it's got two different types of rye. So it really has layer upon layer of rye. Um, you can drink this neat, uh, as I have done and will do right now, um, but you can certainly add ice, put this into any of the same cocktails I've said before. You know, Manhattan Sir Sazerac, the traditional Manhattan is actually made with uh, rye. Um, Highballs are getting big too, so if you think about the Japanese culture and on American whiskeys as well, um, the ability to do rye whiskey or bourbon or our, our smoke products and just add bubbly water to it, that's something that, you know, it's a very consistent and easy thing to drink. Uh, food pairing wise, uh, steaks and blue cheese chopped salads for me. Um, this is really, really good with like an endive salad would do really well. So the heartiness of that, of the endive does really, really well with this. Um, I like that chicory. I'm a big, like big farmer's market guy. So um, the ability to try new things and find new stuff I like with it. I'm always open. If you find something you like with any of my products or anything else, just tag us on, on Instagram. I look forward to seeing it. So that's a Sonoma Rye product. 100% um, rye, generally again between two and a half to, to four years old. A really sort of fun, dynamic product. Any other questions that, that might be pertinent to this time before I jump into the last couple? Uh, 
Sure. Um, what are your thoughts on chewing the whiskey? Ooh, whoever said that, high five. Um, so chewing whiskey is totally cool and I respect it. Um, the chew or the Kentucky chew that they're referring to um, really is about sort of appreciating and, and, and disseminating the, the, the viscosity of that whiskey in your mouth. Now, that viscosity, if it's been produced in a larger commercial setting, is largely wood driven from the barrels themselves. So a 15 year old Willet, for example, is going to be largely more tannin based than the base grain based or base uh, spirit based. And that's fine. That's totally great. That's appreciated and good. If you can't trick time, you can trick, you can make something taste good that's younger, but you can't make something taste younger that's they say they taste younger older um so the chew is great if you're going to be sitting there enjoying a glass of whiskey usually neat um because if it gets cold it's a little harder to chew um but i absolutely endorse it and appreciate it and again it goes back to the, the, the theory that it's your your whiskey to do as you see fit with so i i appreciate and support that no matter which way you do it and um, the chew itself is generally just a demonstrator is literally just taking it And just like letting it sort of, you know, uh, wash the machine inside your mouth a little bit. Great. I've got some more at the end, but I think we can continue for now. Awesome. So we do something really fun on site too. So on everything else I got in my little Wooly Wonka facility, um, we are also smoking our own ingredients on site. So back in the day, originally, we used to buy a smoked ingredient from a company called Breeze out of in Minnesota um for the first i don't know three years four years of our lives four years into the business let's say it's 2014 we realized we can actually start doing this our, ourselves so we built a little four by four so four foot by four foot by about eight foot tall smoke shed and started smoking grains um ourselves using local california cherry wood but technically you can use apple wood or apricot or all sorts of fun ones and one of the things I found is, especially in the cocktail culture, is a lot of people are making cocktails using um, maraschino. So I thought, why don't I go ahead and make a, a cocktail, a whiskey that already has it in there? Um, so what we do is we take California cherry trees, we dry aged the wood for about six months. There are all the trees are usually grown in Stockton, California, which is not too far away from the distillery either. And then we cold smoke the uh grains these are like fully malted grains these are not the raw ingredients but just the fully malted ones we actually have evolved since the four by four smoke shed now we have a, a, a shipping container that we built um a, a, a smoker in and we lay a ton of grains out on their bed and everybody's familiar with 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 smoking meats um uh, we do a cold smoke which is um at about 90 degrees fahrenheit for uh, 40 to 45 hours. So we, we slowly put the wood in there. It billows the smoke inside. That process is a very, very slow, very cold process. What it does is it saturates the grains with all this cherry wood flavor. And we then use those cherry wood smoke grains in the mash bill. So I created two products in particular with that. One of them is a bourbon and one's a rye. The rye was unique because there really wasn't a lot of or any smoked rye out there. This one is a um, cherry wood smoked rye or cherry wood rye. So it's 80% rye, 10% wheat, 10% cherry wood smoked barley. You, can, you can't really see it too well because it's really beautiful, like red hue to them. Again, natural coloring. We don't, you know, mess with any of that. Um, that's just from the cherry wood smoke impacting the, the, the flavor of the grain. So this one was meant also to taste a bit like cherry soda or like a Manhattan. So I like to think of this as sort of like a cocktail without using anything else. Um, in time, we might play around with some other wood smokes or even maybe a, a, a peat, a piece of moss. So if you think about um, moss, moss burns differently than wood does. Wood is burns very big and bright and beautiful. So this, you know, it, this tastes a bit lighter. It's not so iodine driven. It's more like a barbecue. 
Um, but because it's only 10% of the mash, 10% of the total grains used, it's not very strong. So it's going to be really is more like a, a Manhattan. You probably heard me making that noise a couple more times. That's also another way I've learned to sort of aerate the um, the product as well. So it's in my mouth, I'm sort of applying air by by, by fussing it around. It's a, it's a good way to do it and it's something I recommend, especially if you're transitioning between different products that lets your palate sort of uh, in a fast way, quickly um, neutralize everything that's going on. So that's cherrywood rye. Um, last one on there would be cherrywood smoked bourbon. Similar flavor profile to the cherrywood rye. The main difference, of course, from that perspective is um, it's a really smokier product. So um, when, I, when I say smokier, it's not like a Lagavulin or a, an Octomore or a Laphroaig because it's very, very smoky. You know, the PPMs of smoke on here are far, far less. Um, but we do make a cherrywood rye, a cherrywood bourbon as well. You know, both of these are great in, in you know, sort of holiday settings that tell people, you know, Thanksgivings and Christmases and Hanukkahs and that sort of situation. Um, really, really good food pairing wise on both of these um, is uh, boar and venison, so more gamier meats. Um, you know, think about anything where you're, where you're using like a reduction sauce on there. I'd recommend this, especially like a wine reduction sauce on there. Um, barbecue, can't go wrong. This is a bourbon, 67% corn, 20% rye, 13% shared with some barley. So just a little bit more smoke on there, comes through a lot more, especially because corn is a very pliable grain there too. I love it. Uh, I mean, admittedly, I love all my children equally. These, these four have become our, our new mainstay. Every once in a while, we'll release other products as well, different barrel finishes. I do have black truffle rye from time to time too. I have a single malt coming out this year. So single malt is the, the, the category that scotch is in, but scotch has to be made in Scotland. Um, single malt is just malted barley. And so we have some of that potentially coming out this year as well. And maybe some brandies too. I haven't really quite decided yet. That's pretty much everything we make. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, what are some experiences you had at Dickinson that have helped you? Um, I, I think some of it had to do with, I did a public speaking course there that um, I'm not sure if that's helping right now. I'm not sure how I would grade out of that, but you know, the capacity to stand up in front of people and articulate your, your thinking, your ideas, that class was, was really great. Um, you know, I was a political science major, so political science for me um, was an opportunity to think really critically about what you, what you perceive to be the truth and how you, how you hear things. And, and how information is, is, is disseminated and, and thought of. So that was really, really sort of interesting for me um, as, as, a, as a young, you know, Californian who is attending um, a school in the middle of Pennsylvania, um, especially because everybody around us was so completely different. It, it helped me a lot too, especially as I've traveled the country, have a lot of friends who are distillers and we politically just do not see eye to eye at all. But you know there is middle ground. There's middle. There's there's a lot of creative energy and appreciation for what we do. And even if we happen to have you know really really honest conversations, um, it's been good for us. So I think Dickinson helped with that too because uh, California in the middle of Pennsylvania is a, is a rarity. How long can you reuse a barrel, and what do you do with them afterwards? Good question. So. Um, we do a, a, some additional barrel finishes sometimes. Sometimes we'll recoup a barrel or or, or rechar a barrel. Sometimes we'll we'll put the the whiskey back in that same barrel again for what's called a double barreling process. So we can reuse a barrel several times. Um, barrels, generally speaking, can last a long time as long as they're wet. Um, one of the persons I worked with for in 2013 was a guy named Hubert Germain Rabon, sort of the the prominent. American brandy uh, distiller from Cognac originally. And uh, he had some 20, 25 year old barrels that he brought from Cognac to America. So the answer is you can use barrels for a very long period of time, as long as you don't put something in there that's bad um, or you keep them hydrated, either using um, water, you know, 
sometimes using a, what's called a boise, which is water that's actually been infused with alcohol, um, or you're rebarreling that product again. Uh, we sell our used barrels a lot to local breweries in our area. There's actually a, another um, Dickinsonian uh, we've worked with over at Armistice, which is based out of the East Bay, so really close to our distillery. Um, they've taken our old barrels and made a really awesome beer out of it. So uh, beer people like us. And um, we have a good relationship there because sometimes I'll get the barrels back and do some of a beer, beer uh, finish as well. Um, I see a lot of people also do pickles and hot sauces and kimchi and all sorts of cool things. So uh, barrels do certainly have a second life after we're done with them. Do you sell smaller bottles or sampler sets to taste before purchasing full bottles? Uh, yeah, so we, um, in the state of California, it's a little easier because it's our home state. Um, we do sell a three pack, uh, which is available usually year round, especially at the distillery itself. And that three pack has the Sonoma rye, Sonoma bourbon, and Cherrywood rye. And those three products are available. Um, we do sell, we do sell those. Um, in the state of New York, we do have some 375 bottles, which are smaller formats. So it's basically half the size of the 750. Uh, we do sell those in those states and sometimes we'll sell them in California. If you go to Duty Free at JFK, SFO, or LAX, um, granted no one's going there right now, but when the time comes to go there again, um, we do have uh, a, pr a presence there as well. And excitedly, we do have um, custom Duty Free boxes that we work with there too. So you'll see our, our little sample sets there as well. Does higher priced whiskey have significantly higher costs? like production and long-term storage? No. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, the cost is in some ways absolutely no, in no way determined on, on, on quality. Um, usually, I can't say it's always the case, but usually with wine, that's sort of the case. They're using either premium grapes or they've got a, a, a high-end a high or a well-known winemaker behind them, and that's why the product is the, the, the cost that it is. The cost of the ingredients, generally speaking, in whiskeys are almost identical, unless in our case, we have a malt house on site, and then that's that's a labor of love that we'll never recoup in actual, you know, dollars. Um, but what I will say is that we, you know, we will find that a lot of people price whiskeys based on where they think they can sell it at. And so I'm always a little suspect of whiskeys that are at, you know, $200, $300, $400, $400 a bottle. Um, a lot of times it's just they're selling a story. A lot of times it's a really, really fancy bottle. Um, so you're paying for a $10 glass charge. Um, you know, the whiskey can be old too. So older whiskeys certainly, you know, demand higher price points, especially as, as whiskey is sort of a commodity and there's a scarcity of product um, a lot of the time. Um, so I can see that also being a case as well. Um, when they're on the secondary market and people are, are buying stuff that was made, you know, in the mid to, to late 1900s like that might be something that's certainly worth a bit more um just because it's um, never will be made again because the distillers most likely aren't alive still so um yeah i mean price is certainly not always determined on quality um i'm always careful i i my biggest my biggest thing is if it's, it's like if it's, if it's got a fancy box around it or it's got a really really fancy bottle to it i'm always a little suspect of that just because to me, that they spend all their money on one side of the business. They didn't. They didn't spend it. They didn't spend it on the other side, which is quality of the spirit, typically. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I have one question here. I'd like that was a, that's a great one to close on. Um, George is wondering if you would consider making a blend that is very limited and only available to Dickinson alumni. Maybe some of the proceeds from sales could go to the Dickinson Fund. He'd be your first customer. <laughs> Love it. Totally down with that. Um, now, state law has become really interesting because Pennsylvania, as I'm sure you're, you're, you're finding out if you haven't already, that is sort of a crazy market for selling spirit, especially in the COVID situation. I would have imagined there would have been a loosening of things. If anything, it wasn't. Um, but uh, long and short of it is that we, we absolutely would love to do something like that. And I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all game. Um, it might be only through our 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 uh, California market, and we can ship it directly to people out here. Um, but let's talk about it. We can find a retailer to work with. That's the that's the biggest thing. Find finding a 
a retailer to work with. There's a couple of retailers I know of, Mold Dick and some alumni in New York. So maybe we can work something out that way too. Love the <laughs> idea. Well, that's great. I think we've answered pretty much most of the questions. A lot of people just thank you for your time and they're anxious for the cherry wood bourbon. Um, okay. so Adam, thank you very much for giving us some fun in our lives this evening. Um, and thank you all to our alums and parents who have joined us this evening. And um, I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming in, everybody. Please take care of each other and your families. I appreciate this. And we'll get out of this soon. Cheers, everyone. Thanks.